Okay, so shall I start? Or do you yeah, please go longer? ahead. I'll leave it to you as you feel. Uh, no, I think we have a good number of attendees now. Uh, so welcome everyone. So Zoltan is kindly going to show very interesting cases. Actually one, but... <laughs> Okay, so thanks really, really much for the kind invitation. And this is this is a case what I briefly discussed with Neil a couple of uh, months ago when we had two sessions discussing how and what parameters to 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 check as an objective markers of right and left ventricular function. And then I briefly mentioned to him that we introduced vasopressin recently, although we have two or three babies since this case. So it's not that I have a case serious, but anyway, I tell you guys this case, which, which was absolutely a, a game changer for me, my understanding and the way I used to use vasopressin has significantly changed. So I only used in one or two cases during my career, in two or three cases in Cambridge, one or two cases in Oxford, in Oxford, a consultant, which were more like as the very last resort in septic shock. So never kind of like early on, because I mean, my understanding has always been that if you got noradrenaline and I use noradrenaline more frequently probably than other neonatologists, and then we introduce noradrenaline into our PP agent guideline, then you don't really need vasopressors. However, this, this, this case clearly changed my mind in this and I will tell you the case and you will see, obviously you can decide whether you see it's a convincing one or not but anyway in just 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 sharing this experience i felt it would fit with with, with the session so this is a case first i present the case and then the literature review and then i put to put to presentation please do let me know if if it's not very legible or there's any problem with the with the layout and just give me feedback or ask any questions during the talk. So second pregnancy, this K baby came from Reading, non-consanguineous parents, term baby, female, birth weight was 2.8 kilogram, no respect of sepsis, spontaneous vaginal delivery, 2 a.m., I think it was Friday morning, Catholic presentation, clear, clear like war, upguards were fine, routine postnatal care and no issues. The baby went to the postnatal ward, standard care, However, reviewed for hypothermia at six hours of life when they found really severe postdoctoral yes. uh, desaturation. The postdoctoral saturation was actually 38 in air. So they started mask oxygen, which had a very good effect on the pre and postdoctoral saturation, and they admitted the baby to the neonatal unit. Cap gas at admission was showing respiratory acidosis, nothing more. So lactacidosis was not present at that moment. Commenced on nasal high flow in Reading at 8 liter, quite high FiO2 from early on. Chest x ray only showed large heart, no major parenchymal disease. And they managed to do an echo there, echo consistent with ongoing PPHN with a large PDA, but structurally, otherwise, it was a normal heart. So they, they, they kept the baby there for a couple of hours, but there was not much improvement during the day. This part, the CO2 clearance got better. However, the FiO2 requirement was just progressively getting worse, although it has never been normal. So FiO2 80%, tachydyspnea, uh, signs of PPH and on the early echo, so they decided that they would intubate the baby. So around four o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, the baby was like 12, 13 hours at that point. No issues with intubation. However, post-intubation, there was quite significant labile hypoxemia saturation fell transiently to 40-50%, started an SIPPB volume guarantee, kind of normally settings in terms of tidal volume. However, the FIO2 requirement just remained very high. They started on morphine. Dopamine was also started and uh, referred the baby to us. So the transport team went out. And by the time they arrived, the baby was already on some dopamine. Uh, UAC, UVC was cited treated for suspected sepsis. However, at that point, the CRP and the white cells were normal. And then they given surfactant, muscle relaxants, and then they put the baby onto high frequency. We can do high frequency during transport. And they started inhaled nitric oxide. And there was not much issue during the transport, uneventful practically. And then they arrived around midnight, I was on call. Uh, to the JR, 
and the baby was 22 hours old at that point. Arriving blood gas was practically normal. Baby was muscle relaxed with vacuronium on high frequency, nitric oxide already, which made made uh, or made the saturations better. However, the FiO2 requirement was persistently high. Ventilator settings, I would say, were moderate in considering the circumstances. FiO2 do 80, amplitude was only 26, which provided normal CO2 clearance. However, the oxygenation index remained high despite nitric oxide, it was 21 at arrival. And by that time, when they arrived, the CRP was already 29, which went up further. So it was a PPA gen due to early onset sepsis. And this is our guidance, what, thanks to Neil, uh, who helped us put this together. And actually, I saw this guideline first when I went to a Congress in Liverpool, which was arranged by NIM. So that's how I know these two guys. And uh, actually, it says optimized ventilation, lung inflation, sedation, acid waste, calcium, magnesium, and sepsis, which, which is exactly how we left it in the CDH guideline. But we adapted this, and then we incorporated this into our PPH and guidance. We added those parameters. So we have a separate guidance for CDH, and we have a separate one for PPH. And just to do almost as a tick box for the train is what to check and, and what we mean under optimizing ventilation and lung inflation and sedation acid base in PPH and if it's not a CDH. So chest X-ray, ribs should be at the ninth ribs, uh, lung inflation, no leak, sedate the baby properly, use fentanyl or midazolam or needed, muscle relaxant only if needed, UAC, UVC, absolute must. And then, then we, we also provided those ranges, what we think should be followed or should be aimed in babies if it's not a CDH. So we were doing that along with the registrar who was on, but obviously I came in for this baby. And then we repeated surfactant. And this is the admission X-ray at the mean airway pressure of 14. You see pneumomedia sinum and highly un, I mean underinflated lungs. So what we did, we progressively started increasing the mean airway pressure. The baby was on nitric oxide anyway. So the baby was on nitric oxide anyway. And then this is at the mean airway pressure of 15, five o'clock. And this is at the mean airway pressure of 20. So the compliance wasn't best. But with, with progressively increasing the mean airway pressure, we managed to we managed to inflate the lungs better than, than at arrival. Unfortunately, this did not really result in improvement. So from midnight, nine o'clock, by the start of the ward round, you see that the pH was still okay. PCO2 clearance was not an issue. However, and basic cess was more or less okay, lactate remained low. However, with the progressive increase of the mean airway pressure, and using high mean airway, uh, high FIO2 to, to reach the saturation targets, actually the oxygenation index, which was 20 at arrival, finally went up to 60 by the morning. And this is the echo. Uh, I didn't put many echoes in. Uh, because I just didn't waste time on the echoes for this case rather than the literature and more. But I mean, it is clear that there is quite significant right ventricular dysfunction, left ventricle is compressed. And I think they went up with the dopamine even over 10, 15, what we suggest they should during the transport. So there was quite significant tachycardia and it was, it was actually dominating the, the, the picture in the 48 hours while the baby was on our unit. And um, this is slowed motion because it was for the pediatric grand round for them to see that actually, I mean, the left ventricular function, if you compare it to the right ventricular function was actually better, especially the free wall, but the left ventricular capacity was, was, was very much compressed. And there was this ongoing tachycardia. Mean blood pressure was, was borderline around 40, sometimes a little bit above 40. And this is just the uh, uh, parasternal long axis view to, 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 to show that how much the left ventricular cavity was compressed in view of this very significantly dilated right ventricle. And this is the doctor shunt. Uh, 
we start rolling this at the mean blood pressure of 54 over 34 you see that it's practically unidirectional very nice big duct so we didn't feel at that point we have to manipulate the duct with prostaglandin and it was clear that it's a very severe suprasystemic uh, pulmonary pressure with, with, with clinical and echo features of ongoing PPHN. So this is our guideline, uh, which is the part of the, the uh, pulmonary vasodilation and vasoconstrictor, uh, vasoconstriction bit sildenafil mirinone, hypoxemia, and if it's RV dysfunction, and if the duct is closing, this is adapted from NIM, or oh, sorry, Neil, uh, we, we, we use and actively manipulate the duct here. Obviously, this wasn't the case at this stage. In terms of mean blood pressure, that's a really interesting question. What blood pressure targets to follow? And when we put this together, we agreed with, with Neil that we will use this kind of 45 to 50. Obviously, we got this concept of no, 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 you have to measure the pulmonary blood pressure and you have to aim over it. And I used to do it. I mean, I, oh, actually, I wasn't a consultant in Cambridge, but Cambridge many times did that. And, and usually what it, what it resulted is these babies, even by arriving the unit, were in really high doses of adrenaline, noradrenaline, because sometimes it's just difficult to... To, to reach this target of 75, 80, and it, it, it just lead to a really significant escalation. No treatment. As I understand the lipids 40 to 50 as mean, not systolic, fluid boluses, then dopamine, try to keeping it at low dose in view of the, the literature data from animal studies that it can increase the pump and keep the use hydrocortisone fairly early and depending on the uh, blood pressure value or left ventricular function then we use either adrenaline and noradrenaline in this case we felt that the that the left ventricular function was okay and more importantly the shunt direction at the pfo was was practically uh, with a bit of a left to right component but dominantly dominantly it was right to left, so we felt that we go along with maximizing the ventilatory support, repeating the surfactant with noradrenaline and hydrocortisone. So we started the baby on noradrenaline and hydrocortisone in the morning ward round with some improvement, but close. Right. To act more referral, to act more referral. And during the day, the dopamine was added. I was leaving the scene around this stage. So it was my consultant colleague. And obviously, when things were not really going the right direction, they felt, OK, guys, ECMO referral is necessary here. But unfortunately, before the, the referral or, or when Kevin sat down to speak to them, the half correction was given, which resulted in better blood pressure. And suddenly, with the better blood pressure, the oxygenation index fell down, saturation improved. So at the end of the discussion, the discussion wasn't that, okay, immediate ECMO referral and, and can you mobilize the Leicester mobile ECMO team, which we contacted, but rather then, okay, you can keep the baby, hopefully things will get better with your very, very combined and appropriate treatment. And let's see what happens. And actually what happens in the next 12 hours was not really in favor of of keeping the baby in Oxford because the oxygenation index just, just remained persistently high. And then and by Sunday, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, it was just getting worse. So we repeated the scan, obviously daily echoes here. Saturday, it was the cardiologist, Sunday, uh, cardiologist and myself. And what was obvious that the duct has closed. It was a very small duct, really significant, right ventricular hypertrophy, oh, sorry, um, dilatation. So we felt at this stage that we need to reopen the duct and obviously make a, a full formal referral for this baby to go to an ECMO center. So we started prostin and also we started sildenafil in view of the ongoing persistent issue with hypoxemia. So except for mirinum, practically everything was, was, was on by this stage, apart from adrenaline and mirinum. Uh, and that was the time when things were getting really, really out of control because the OI was just high, lactate started rising, 
So it was a clear cut that, okay, no further discussion, this baby needs to go to an ECMO center. And at that point, we started having really significant hypoxemic episode every time the blood pressure dropped. And then I just put this from the nursing notes, photocopied, you see that, and it was more and more apparent that every time the baby, the baby had some volume, so saline bolus at 1140, blood pressure mean immediately improved during bolus over 60, and subsequently the saturation improved over 88%. And then another one here, 130, mean blood pressure 50 to 55, since noradrenaline dose was increased, saturation improved, feed ductile is actually over 93 or over 90 with the mean, mean blood pressure of 53. So it was clear that for this baby, pushing up the blood pressure has an immediate, very significant improvement. But then that was, it's recorded. Okay, so I don't use, <laughs> use terms which are not appropriate. So when something hits the fan and then it turned out that the, that the actual, the mobile ECMO team in Leicester was not available, which was quite a, quite a bad news at that point. They suggested we contact SOAR, which is our Southampton Oxford Retriever Service for Cardiac Babies. But they said that now, guys, this baby is very unstable. So please contact the Leicester team. So we went back to the Leicester team and they said, okay, unfortunately there is no mobile ECMO, but we tried, we will go and then try to keep the baby alive. And we go and we try to try to uh, mobilize the baby. And at that point, these, these hypoxemic event was just becoming more and more severe. So four o'clock, this is from the nursing notes. You can see acute deterioration, query handling, PVL, pre-doctor pre saturation at some point fell 30% post-doctor 12. So it was practically a kind of periodic situation. So we were in real, real, real desperation. And then what we did, we immediately stopped the prostin and also everything which is vasodilative along with the sildenafil. And then we, start, uh, we started the baby on, on uh, adrenaline and vasopressin. And here is when you will see adrenaline and vasopressin started and it was all the way through and I didn't put the fur previous date in, but you see that this, we've never been able to get out of this tachycardia irrespective that we introduced hydrocortisone fairly early. Obviously noradrenaline at that point was 300, dopamine I think they went up during the course to 20. I tried to reduce it again, we were on dobutamine 20, so, so loads of catecholamines, loads of catecholamines. And you can see the blood pressure, although it was labile, it wasn't that bad that one you would just assume that, well, you, you need to push the blood pressure higher. However, the clinical response was every time there whenever we push the blood pressure. So having introduced adrenaline, and that's the problem with this case that we introduced them at the same time. So you might argue what we see is adrenaline. However, that was really, really, really striking that the heart rate came down along with the blood pressure. His systolic went up very high for a term baby, so 80, sometimes up to 90. And with this, very high blood pressure and normalizing heart rate, what happened was absolutely mind-blowing and unbelievable. And we can say that actually saved this baby's life. So the oxygenation indices fell down to 20, then six to eight. So when the Leicester ECMO team arrived, obviously not the mobile ECMO team, just the retriever service, we, they started discussions that, well, guys, why do you want to move this baby? This baby is stable. We don't want it's less than 10. So can't you keep this baby here for a couple of days? And we said, no, 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 please do take the baby now. Because then at four o'clock when we had pre doctor saturation 30, post doctor 10, we just didn't feel that, that this baby will actually ever get to this point to, to be in a state where we can transport the baby to an ECMO center. So they take the baby, very safe, uneventful transfer to Leicester. Initially, they didn't put the ECMO, so they kept the baby on because there was good oxygenation. However, they were unable to be in from inotropes. So finally, the baby, three days after admission, went on to VA ECMO for four or five days then decannulated, two days later, came back to Oxford. These are the settings, which are fairly, no, fairly normal, fairly low, 
with uh, some nitric oxide and merinone, which we gradually wean down. And then the echo normalized, merinone stopped, nasal cannula oxygen extubated, normal echo by day 15. And then uh, we discharged the baby back to Reading on day 16. And actually, after a week, the baby went home with normal cranial ultrasound and absolutely normal neurological examination. So that's the case which changed my, 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 my perception about vasopressin completely. And actually, vasopressin was a lifesaver here. And I was wondering what might have or could have happened if I put this baby or the team put this baby on Saturday on vasopressin when we had this ongoing tachycardia video wise 40-45. So a little bit of about vasopressin, posterior, uh, uh, pituitary or posterior part of the pituitary gland uh, synthesizes vasopressin. Actually, it is synthesis there from axonal transport. Uh, V2 receptors, renal and fluid reabsorption. However, vasopressin, if you give it arginine vasopressin, actually it, is, it has paradoxically is increasing the urinary output and sometimes cause or can cause quite significant natriuresis. And um, the major effect, what we would like to exploit here is the vasoconstriction on V1 receptor. And actually it, it, it has some selectivity and many are saying that actually vasopressin is more selective to splenic vessels, to uh, muscles and to the skin and leaves the brain vessels, pulmonary vessels. Actually, some are saying that it is even a vasodilator for the pulmonary vessels through nitric oxide release. And uh, by some transitional research data, it might improve the coronary perfusions. So what we achieve with vasopressin, obviously by increasing the blood pressure, we, 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 we hope to, 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 to achieve shunt reversal. So the interatrial and the PDA shunt should be re reversed if, if, if we manage to get the blood pressure over the pulmonary blood pressure. So shunt reversal, selective reduction of the pulmonary vascular resistance and better coronary perfusion with higher systemic blood pressure and lower heart rate and improved right ventricle and left ventricle function. So which one was, was the key for our babies and, and having seen this miraculous improvement, I still don't know because we just didn't do an echo because we were so happy and the transport team arrived, we should have done an echo and then we would know whether we managed to, to achieve shunt reversal or it was an improving function which, which, which uh, resulted or a drop in the pulmonary vascular resistance, which was key to success here. If you check the literature, and obviously after that, we felt that, okay, guys, we have to, we have, we have to include vasopressin in our PPH and guidance, not as a first line, but, but it should officially be here. And, and, and maybe we need to be a little bit more proactive to start it in cases like this in the future. So there are four studies. One was the earliest one, post-operative pulmonary hypertension in TAPVD. It's only the studies which are in PPHN, and anybody can check this review on, on, on this topic. And the two papers which are case series, one is from Patrick McNamara, 10 cases. This one is from, uh, and this one is from uh, Kinsella and, and John Glenn. So I think the biggest name in, in nitric oxide USA are involved in this case series, which, which I will show you soon. And there is one case from Arvin Siegel uh, from Australia from 2014. So I would go because there is a very, very super table. Here it is. So this is the paper. And these are the studies, the four studies. The first one is a TAPVD case, uh, only two cases, but both has improved. And I use this table and I felt I don't copy paste rather than showing you the, the actual table for the dosing. So they were using this 0.3 to 1.2 milli unit per kg per minute. And these two cases, the expected effects has or have happened. So mean blood pressure improved, pulmonary pressure decreased, 
and I know this continued. They developed hyponatremia. And then comes the, the case series from Patrick McNamara, refractory PP agent, 10 cases, term babies, causes, none of them have diaphragmatic hernia, meconium aspiration, HIE, pulmonary hypoplasia, and sepsis. And they were kind of those babies, what or that, what we feel that, that vasopressin might have a role. So those ones who are nitric unresponsive, they are some form of, of, of uh, cardiovascular support. They were on dopamine, dobutamine. Some of them were on epinephrine and mirinone 3. This was the dose range. The median range or the, med yeah, the median time of starting it was like end of day two, but the range was from four to 139 hours. Four died, four died, but the blood pressure improved. Uh, pulmonary arterial pressure improved. OI significantly frequently dropped even by six hours. I know those was successfully reduced on those ones who survived. No change in sodium. And obviously one of the side effects, which we are a bit afraid of is, is, is splanchnic vasoconstriction, ischemia, necrotizing enterocolitis, and none of the baby had it. And that is this case report by, by Arvind, which is one case, ELBV uh, uh, neonate, W neonate. However, this was a uh, five month old with severe pulmonary hypertension and severe BPD. Those ranges here a little bit lower what the others were using, but it was according to their case report an absolute success and, and they managed to, to get the baby off of, of, of nitric oxide and no adverse uh, event reported. And th this is the paper which was also something which puzzled me because we had discussions about left ventricular issues and, 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 and obviously the significance of that, especially in CDH, the early phase. So I was also always a bit, 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 bit wary about starting anything uh, vasoconstrictor in diaphragms in the early phase, but these guys, 13 cases, all met ECMO criteria, term babies, dopamine, hydrocortisone, all, epinephrine, most of them, mirin on most of them, they start vasopressin. And in this, in the paper, they don't really check left ventricular function. They just started them to try to rescue them from ECMO. And actually, practically 50% of them managed to get away from ECMO. Mean, uh, mean blood pressure improved, OI improved. And I mean, this is striking that without checking the left ventricular function, you put these babies on two phase of pressing and half of them, half of them uh, can be saved from ECMO. Uh, they had hyponatremia, which was corrected according to that, that guideline, what you sent across Mahmoud. So going back to, to my talk, the last few slides. So after this, having read these review papers and these, these, these papers, we felt, okay, we put vasopressin in. So this is word by word, so it's copy paste from our guideline. So we added consider vasopressin in case of catecholamine resistant hypotension, or when oxygenation significantly improves at higher BP values, such as our case. And this is our flow chart, which we have updated. So in this part where it is the blood pressure, we put vasopressin with this dose range. In our baby, the dose what we started was fairly high. It was 0 0.83. So it wasn't a kind of uh, nice gradual build up. We, we went almost to maximal dose. We haven't changed this, although that is up for discussion. Maybe we should. So that's the case. And that's the absolute, absolute striking response to vasopressin. And questions I put that is anyone else using vasopressin in PPA gen? And if so, do you check the left ventricular function if the left ventricular function is poor? And obviously it's up for discussion. How do you check what parameters you check? Is it just the interatrial shunt or something more sophisticated? And what is the systemic blood pressure that we should target in PP agent and what other people are targeting? And these things which, which, which with noradrenaline, unfortunately, we often see 
this tachycardia and uh, my question is to everyone who has attended this session is that do you see this because i think since since rose is course give me one second i'm sorry I'm, I'm giving a talk can you give me 15 20 minutes okay sorry about this but i'm on service um uh, so 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 i use that noradrenaline often and i think to me the rose paper which was a really nice and systemic evaluation and and and, and demonstrating at least at echo level that actually it has a role in pp agent and and i always felt that if you use noradrenaline probably you don't need to use other vasoconstrictors but i mean with this case this 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 really nice drop in the heart rate improving blood pressure which we were unable to reach for two days even with hydrocortisone kind of changed my perception about whether it's noradrenaline vasopressin and it might be that 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 i should be using vasopressin rather than noradrenaline in those cases where i would like to increase the systemic vascular resistance in pph okay thank you very much Thanks, Zoltan, that was brilliant. Um, I think I'm pretty sure we'll have lots of discussion and lots of questions from people. I try um, to keep it short. No, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. Uh, Neil? Um, hi guys, thanks very much, Zoltan. That was a brilliant talk. And um, I really, really interested in your experience with Vasa Preston in that case. Um, I, I think it, a few things that just came to mind. The first is from the first echoes, it was interesting to see what the kind of cardiac, cardiovascular phenotype was in this baby because it definitely seemed to be more um, right heart failure, RV dilatation, LV compression, and maybe not quite so much kind of um, severe LV failure as, mm -hmm. as the mechanism. And I that, think that, that's why we, we started with yeah. more adrenaline rather than with adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, I, and I think, as you say, the, the mechanisms of kind of using vasoconstrictors in that case are, 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 are or, or using these drugs that is, are probably multiple, including possibly this effect on coronary perfusion, um, plus, I suppose, this, this potential pulmonary vasodilating effect of vasopressin, which I thought was really interesting, is potentially really interesting. Um, more other thoughts were just how striking, as you said, the heart, high heart rate was, and how actually that was almost certainly probably is making things worse, wasn't it? Impairing diastolic filling and therefore ejection. And um, it, it's interesting that it's, that that bringing the heart rate down, whether that was a primary or a secondary effect, definitely seemed to make a difference. And just on that comment, you you might have seen at the CDH meeting last week the guys from Bonn, Florian. Kip Muir and colleagues had an abstract on using beta blockers. They use this beta blocker Landiolol um, in some of their diaphragms and with a specific intention of slowing the heart rate down. And I think that's an interesting concept. I, um, not, you know, it's more about the physiological effect of slowing heart rate, improving filling, improving diastolic function in these, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. And then um, the, the third, just to, to, I suppose you, you posed some questions for us at the end, so I'm, I'm just kind of reflecting on those. Um, like you in the past, I've always been really cautious in the ones that have severe LV dysfunction um, about use of drugs that are potentially vasoconstricting. Um, but I'm, I'm slowly kind of rethinking that um, in the ones who've got more of their RV phenotype like you've shown here. Um, and the, the, the effect of vasopressin is kind of quite, uh, compelling i think in, in that setting i actually wonder whether you know as we gain more confidence in it we actually push it up the protocol and make it you know uh, use it earlier not as a kind of third line, line, yeah. Adrenaline, adrenaline. yeah yeah um interestingly i was chatting to arvind about vasopressin a couple of weeks ago by chance we were kind of discussing exactly this kind of situation and one of the things he said was they like it in the, with their experience now of it, they like it in the short term, much as with the response you saw. But then he said one of the problems is after a couple of days, you start running into a lot of fluid retention and edema and um, whether that starts to kind of become more of an issue with you if you try to use it more chronically. But uh, like uh, you, he definitely was describing acute short-term benefits like you saw as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in, in a specific setting of diaphragms, the answer is I'm not sure yet. 
Um, I think, as you say, that the, the, the series from Denver, um, they didn't they didn't kind of um, describe which the, the exact nature of the, the right and left ventricular dysfunction. And but um, I, I'm 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 coming around to the idea that maybe it's not as as bad in the milder LV dysfunction and and might definitely have some benefit there. So really interesting presentation and and definitely making me think more about how we use it properly. Can I just ask one last question? What 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 did you ever get an organism for this baby? What was the nature of the sepsis? No, never never uh, no. never grown anything. Okay, but the, my reason for asking that question is because. Okay, okay. The reason I asked is just because I suppose our, our own experience using vasopressin is pretty is limited to gram-negative sepsis, where we get kind of profound, you know, vasodilatation, uh -huh. low SVR, vasoplegic shock type picture. So that's where we we we're, we're pretty comfortable with using it already. But that's why I wondered if if, if this did turn out to be a gram-negative sepsis or not. But uh, yeah, but thanks very much. Really Thank interesting you. case and really thought for thought provoking. Thanks, Zoltan. So Mahmoud, I'm fine if you you. Uh... I think I think Sol has a question. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm kind of just a yeah. presenter. I let you. Okay, great. Um, uh, really enjoy that. Uh, a challenge is when you're in the middle of the unit and nothing works. <laughs> so being everybody being on there. Uh, it's a little bit of question about the origin of the. Where did it come from? And, uh, that sort of follow up the question on the sepsis. Um, sort of, was it any other markers apart from CRP indicating the sepsis of the baby? Uh, that well, actually, the it, I will explain the reason I asked. Yeah. So it was a bit highish white cell count, but never that kind of full blown, like, you know, profound neutropenia or very high high white cell count. The CRP went up to 92, and then it came down gradually, but fairly quickly. Even day two, day three, the CRP started dropping. So obviously, yeah, the positive predictive value and the specificity the sensitive of CRP is, is, is not 100%. So it might have been not even sepsis. However, over 50, we even if it's a negative culture and the baby is this sick, we think that it was a very likely sepsis, but I'm open for discussion or debate. No, no, no. I completely agree with that. The, what was interesting is the first six hours the baby was with a mom in postnatal work. Uh, because in hours, in nothing, practice, yeah. I ended up having a couple of the severely hypoxic babies, which in fact actually they were missed being hypoxic. And this hypoxia triggered the um, the sort of the PPHN or let's say going back to fetal circulation mm -hmm. up to the level that I think uh, we had one baby on ECMO and one just avoiding an ECMO. So this is kind of a serious, a normal baby, more or less everything is fine, uh, but getting cold, uh, getting hypoxic and prolonged episode of this and six hours, I would say it's a prolonged episode suddenly, you know, exacerbates into the, a massive tragedy. But when, you, when you're saying 92 CRP, I think it's probably a little bit, um, how to say, a little bit uneasy to, to I don't know, up to the 30, 40. There is a thought about using surfactant, you can get some kind of the increase of inflammation marker, you know, and CRP, but not at the levels of 90. So most likely you, you did have the, the, the um, sort of the certain amount of infection, but it's interesting because there was no, you know, drop. So it's not really gram negative because you're not coagulation disorder. It's not, it's not, uh, you know, sort of the neutropenia. Um, GBS, yeah, that could be as well, but they did not affect your blood pressures initially, I understand. They were sort yeah, of yeah, that's correct. reasonable numbers as well. Mm -hmm. So it is a little a bit... Transitional failure for a transitional failure precipitated by hypothermia, hypothermia. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, much, much, much quicker response and then why this baby requires ECMO then? So yeah. I think that, that there was underlying disease here. Yeah, okay, it, so it, that's... It, that's it, that's it was sepsis, but... It might well, I think it definitely will take into account now the the 
there was a person um, on the boat when I'm in a very similar situation like you are. <laughs> and I know we are recording, so the, your slides and your, your doses and your 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 sort of your guideline will be available if sort yeah, of in actually, the middle of the night and, and actually in terms of dosing i think what mahmoud uh shared it's a very very written stuff what what was shared on the chat by by the uh, patrick mcnamara's group um, uh, thank you very much it was by regan geisinger Okay, I think because your microphone is down, as I see on the. I thought so. Your hands was before me, Mahmoud. So uh, what okay. was the question? Thanks, Bikash. So <clears throat> Zoltan, I think um, just quite a few thoughts about this case because we see that very often, and sometimes you're just puzzled what to do. Um, do you, do you usually target? Try to target because I know that's one of your questions um, for us as a group, do you target a specific blood pressure? And when you do that, do you rather target systolic rather than mean, or do you go what, what, with centiles, uh, I suppose? Um, and the concept of shunt reversal, because I know people are moving away from that now, um, just to give time for the heart to recover and uh, provide the systemic circulation, even with right to left duct, um, and maintain the duct open as you already alluded. Do you, th uh, do you think that would, would have done a different outcome uh, rather than trying to achieve a specific blood pressure? And did you have any effect of Merinona tool when you started that? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so, so what we put is mean for all PPA gen, 45 to 50. Obviously, some are even saying that, that the gestation rate should be okay, so you don't need to target high. I understand some are targeting whatever was found on the echo for the systolic. So we are targeting mean, and we put a little bit higher than the kind of usual gestation age. But you can read uh, PPA gen guidelines protocols where they say no, you just need to aim for the, for the gestational. Uh, I think when the cardiologist did the scan on Saturday, he suggested try to aim for a bit higher blood pressure because the systolic blood pressure was found to be, or the, the pulmonary was found to be 65. And, it, and they might have been chasing a bit higher blood pressure, but actually a bit higher blood pressure did not really change anything because the, the OIs remained very high. It was when you're given a fluid bolus and the blood pressure went up or when the nurses were changing the inotropes or the nasal vasoconstrictors or when we started pushing up the hydrocortisone despite the, 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 the high heart rate. That's when you see, so, so it, it, it might have been that that was the time when we reversed the shunt. However, very interestingly, we still saw that very positive effect of high blood pressure despite the fact that the duct was almost closing by Sunday. So it was either at the atrial level, to that extent, or that, that's it, or it was atrial level or intrapalmular. I don't know, guys. I mean, obviously, it's up for discussion. Please help me to understand this case. But it, 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 it was really, really, really eye-opening. And practically, vasopressin saved this baby's life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no doubt about that. And sometimes, uh, as, as Neil said, and you said as well, if you have LV dysfunction, you hesitate to aim increase the yeah. SVR because I was just going to put more pressure on the LV. Um, maybe a combination of inotropic plus vasopressor uh, is the best thing in these situations because the problem is that, you know, dopamine, uh, adrenaline, or even noradrenaline can have effect on PVR. They can increase PVR, so it's, it doesn't come without side effects that can in, um, aggravate the pulmonary hypertension. Whereas vasopressor is purely vasopressor. And as you said, sometimes it's, it acts on the pulmonary vessels to dilate as well. So it's a win-win. But um, And, and they, they drop in the heart rate and then, then improve, you know, longer diastolic time, better coronary perfusion. Absolutely. It's a shame that, that we, we, we're just so happy and we're working on the document 
patient and negotiating it, the ECMO team to take this baby rather than taking the scan. So we should have done a scan at that point to, to, to see what has happened. Either the pulmonary pressure drop or the, 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 the shunt reverse. So, so what caused this, this, this OI dropping less than 10 within a half an hour? Yeah, thanks. That's really brilliant. Thank we you. missed that, unfortunately. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, thank you, Zoltan, for such a lovely presentation. Sorry, I missed the first half of it because I was, you know, on the clinical ship. But just in terms of a uh, few comments, uh, uh, and particularly you asking us experience. So I've used uh, vesopressin in two occasions, both of them for uh, PPHN. Uh, one was meconium, one was uh, sepsis. And both of them, uh, you know, uh, probably saved them from uh, uh, ECMO. Probably I used it as a rescue therapy and both the time we just had a protocol just as a user rescue therapy rather than anything else because blood pressure was not responding uh, to anything at all. And uh, just in terms of what similar with Mahmood was asked, uh, commenting in terms of uh, using vesoprocin along with uh, in not as a monotherapy but along with other inotropes as... Yeah, so like merinone plus vasopressin or dobutamine plus vasopressin. Uh, I mean, in both occasions, I uh, the, low dose. Yeah, so I don't have a guideline as such. Mm -hmm. And my experience has been limited just with two cases. And from research, what I've looked into is more as a rescue therapy rather than anything else. And in those, both the cases, these babies were on cocktail of few inotropes on both occasions. Probably we were pressed to the wall. So it was not, uh, it was used as a rescue rather than as a plan. Uh, because we already referred this baby for ECMO. And probably in both the occasions, uh, as far as I remember, one of them went for ECMO but did not need ECMO. Another mm -hmm. one did not go for ECMO at all. So both the cases, it was useful. And I believe that probably as a vasopressor effect, it does not only helps in perfusion of the tissues, but probably also venous return because scientifically, if you have more forward flow, then you have a more, uh, uh, you know, arteries to capillaries, capillaries back into vein. So it also have uh, filling back also might help in filling again. So as a more forward flow back. And, uh, and in terms of Mahmood, what I, uh, your comment in terms of your blood pressure targeting, I generally feel more comfortable in tar targeting systolic blood pressure when I'm trying to achieve because probably the mean is when, particularly when you have uh, left ventricular failures, your LVDP, your left ventricular and diastolic pressures might impact your mean falsely, giving you a, mm -hmm. a false elevation of your MVP. So I feel more comfortable, you know, if at all I'm, you know, targeting blood pressures. I go for more systolic rather than you feel more what comfortable. Do you target? Hmm? What do you, what value do you target? So do it's you... mostly codependent rather than anything else. So if I see, uh, if I able to do echo assessment and I able to assess your uh, right ventricular pressure, so I try and target it above. Uh, I don't yeah, know I mean, the, the, the only drawback what I saw with this approach, which I used to do, yeah. I mean, but, but as a, as a, as a trainee, not as a consultant, that so many babies end up in this escalating adrenaline 500 norad but 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 i i don't know i think the best would be to somebody take a, like a case i mean i, I won't say that uh, i'm escalating my nootropic support to support uh -huh. to keep on increasing it it's more multifunctional in terms of what baby is doing how's baby responding how is the perfusion happening but uh, what so I, keep, I won't if the, if the systolic pressure is 75 uh, suppose your mean blood pressures, uh, your right ventricular systolic pressure is 75. It doesn't mean that I'm going to target 80s. So I don't uh, do that. Uh, uh, but what I mean to say is if I'm having some numbers there, I want to, you know, I won't blind, uh, you know, just give me a rough guide in terms of, but, uh, you know, there are limits. We don't, I just don't blindly follow that numbers. That's what I meant to say. And do you see when you are reaching that number that actually it works? So the, the shunt start reversing either by echo, but more importantly, clinically. So kind of uh, reaching that target, overcoming is when the, the OI start or... I, I, what are I, your experience? There are uh, certain blood pressures in which babies are happy. So in which you mm -hmm. see the minimum pre and post ductal gaps is minimum on those uh, blood pressures. Instead of targeting those numbers. So, and we see that as as soon as the blood pressure falls below that number, you see the uh, your saturation start gapping. Even, even the pre ductal sats start dropping, not only the sats gap, even the preductal sats dropping. So I think so that's a better clinical mm -hmm. indicator of what your blood pressure should be. And probably on echo parameters, what's your LV doing? What's your systolic function? What's your diastolic function? How much of strain is your RV under? 
those are uh, more guided so uh, so you supplement your clinical findings with your echo parameters i would say uh -huh, uh -huh. would would you excuse me for one second hi hi i think so there are a few hands somebody was knocking on my door <laughs> which you didn't hear so my uh, uh, George, do you so do you what i know Groups would be comfortable with when using uh, vasopressin. If you're using it as a plant way, uh, I think okay. If you ask me blindly, what I would use in PP agent would be mirinone plus vasopressin. That, that that's what I would use mirinone to support so to so have some inotropic effect, lucitropic plus vasopressin. I think what. What I try to do in my practice is, is, is try to, to define whether we are talking about the RV type of phenotype and then the RV systolic function. I think in those babies, it's okay to use more the noradrenaline vasopressin, whereas you have, or it might be combined where, where the LV function is, is, is compromised. Obviously, it's a question how you assess that. Objectively, I think I use in my practice the, the interatrial shunt. So if the interatrial shunt is more left to right, that means that there is probably LV dysfunction. In those babies, I would be reluctant to, to, to introduce vasopressin. But to me, it was really, really surprising that you know the 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 Denver group put all of them onto onto vasopressin and then half of them, you know, get away from ECMO, which is so, so to me, it was like, wow, okay, these babies certainly not reading the papers. That's for sure. And what, what we are using, I, I, I shared with you guys. So this is our... We saw the guideline, yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so this is what and how we use. So Sildenafil, Mirinon, I know, Prostin. And for the vasopressor or the, or the blood pressure management, uh, fluid, dopamine, low dose, try to keep it low dose, hydrocortisone very early, and adrenaline, and now norad plus vasopressin. My so preference you, now, if I see tachycardia ongoing, with noradrenaline, you. now I would switch. We had only two cases so far. Unfortunately, one died. The other one responded by the time I came in where I was like, okay, I put this baby onto vasopressin. As a diaphragm, but so, so I just don't have the case serious. Obviously, I'm kind of, uh, uh, yeah, maybe Giza, we, sh we should, we should, um, we should start a prospective audit for these cases. So any baby who goes on vasopressin to monitor what happens to the heart rate, follow up echo, so 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 to have more data what is happening having started them on vasopressin. So almost like what Rose did with noradrenaline, to repeat it with vasopressin. To see what happens to the function, PDA shunt, and OI heart rate. So, so there's a nice descriptive study for like 10, 20 babies. But I think, yeah, maybe you guys also need it to start doing it and then we can combine the cases for the end to have like 20, 30 cases. Because the problem is it's only two or three cases a year. So it will take a lot of time. Zoltan, can I ask a question? Uh, a great, uh, great presentation. Thank you for sharing this particular case. With your dosing of 0.8, did you have any issues with hyponatremia? Well, I mean, the baby was transferred out within Fairly six hours, so we haven't. And uh, when I read the Lester discharge letter, they were not mentioning anything. After four days, they put the baby onto ECMO, and then probably after that, it was VA ECMO. They, they wrote down all the, all the vasopressors, inotrope, everything. So it was only mirroring on when the baby came. They were not mentioning that there was excessive uh, sodium loss and so the excessive sodium replacement were needed. But I think Regan's guideline, if you check that one or the monograph, they are mentioning uh, what to monitor and how to correct if that appears. And it's interesting, Patrick McNamara's case were reporting zero. The other, the other paper were reporting of you, the Denver group. So I, I don't know actually what would be the rate, 50%, 10% or 90, if you start using it. I just don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, no, thank you so much. And I, the other comment I want to make is I think VASO, I think with more in, improved use, I think the confidence will gain and people start to use it more. And especially in your case, I suspect that would have improved 
uh, pulmonary um, um, blood flow and you get improved pulmonary venous return and therefore increased cardiac output, which would have dropped your heart rate. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that's probably um, the effect of that. Yeah, But I think I, I don't have much experience with these. And I, I'm hoping to sort of use it more frequently. Thank you. Thanks, Zoltan. I really enjoyed that uh, presentation. Um, really interesting also to hear how other people approach babies with refractory PPHN and which agents they use and in which order. Because we're not great noradrenaline users. In fact, I, we don't use it at all, but we do use vasopressin. Uh -huh. And obviously there's similarities there. So we use vasopressin probably a little bit earlier than you would do in that sort of situation. Uh, and as much as a pulmonary vasodilator in babies who are hypotensive with PPHN, that sort of um, scenario where we wouldn't use things like dopamine and hydro dose adrenaline necessarily because of fear of, fears of pulmonary vasoconstriction. So you don't use to, dopamine at all? We don't, no, not in uh -huh. PPHN. We use yeah, I mean, uh, and low dose adrenaline to start off with as supportive treatments. I think in that, uh, the case that you presented, my worry would be the excessive systemic vasoconstriction and reduced LV output in a baby who had restricted filling of the LV, partly because of RV dilatation. So my preference would have been to attack the pulmonary vascular resistance um, more, uh, uh, more aggressively. So obviously using nitric, which you did, uh, and then milrinone early on, as long as your blood pressure Yeah, they, they, they started after 12 hours of admission. There was not much effect. Yeah. And I might have even used some sildenafil in that situation to try yeah, and maximize uh -huh. uh -huh. dilation first. Um, I'm not a great fan of supranormal blood pressures. I have to say we might err on the side of slightly to, towards the upper end uh, mm -hmm. of normal, but not supranormal for two reasons. One, the vasoconstrictive cost of doing that and the concerns about LV output, if you do that. And secondly, not knowing what the damaging effects of high supranormal blood pressure is on other organs. Mm -hmm. Not so much in term babies, but perhaps preterm babies with PPHN, that would yeah, be yeah, yeah, especially. Mm -hmm. yeah. But my question to you and the rest of the group was gonna be slightly different. It's this polypharmacy that you end up with, where you're constantly adding to the list of cardiovascular supportive agents uh, and the reluctance then to withdraw any of them uh, for fear of instability and going backwards. Uh, because by the end of it, if I re was reading your... I started thoughts, reducing the dopamine. That, 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 that was the only thing I achieved mm. to, to, to when, when the blood pressure became this good. Mm. Uh, I started reducing the dopamine, but we were so happy that this baby is alive and we were able to leave us. There. I just mm. didn't have the gut to start, you know, stopping one by one. So, yeah, maybe we should. No, no, I'm not, it wasn't a, meant as a criticism, but more <laughs> yeah. in support that we would find it very difficult as well. And unfortunately, it means that these babies end up on five, six different yeah, You never know what it is that you can stop and what it is that's having the beneficial effect sometimes. I think if you go in with, with yeah, but maybe I, I probably would have reduced a little bit the dobutamine as well, dopamine, obviously. And then I started adrenaline as well. So I think, yeah, first I would probably reduce, but maybe it was a catecholamine resistant shock anyway, despite hydrocortisone. So probably all the catecholamines were not very effective and it was actually vasopressin, which was a game changer. So I might have, might have started reducing them gradually all, which was catecholamine. But we never tried that. <laughs> okay, if you don't mind, guys, they, they are bleeping me. <laughs> so, so, so I have to go back to the unit. But thanks very much for joining and, and I hope you enjoyed. And yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Zoltan. That was brilliant and, and really thanks, interesting Zoltan. discussion. Thank you so Thank much. You, Zoltan. Thank you, Zoltan. Thanks, very interesting. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Till. Bye-bye. Bye. See you next week.